I hope you guys are happy. I really do hope that you're happy, because by the time I'm done reviewing these stupid fanfics, I'm gonna, probably going to be in a mental institution. Again. But you get the idea. <sighs> I'm the fanfic critic. I read it. You listen. Although, in this case, I wish it was reversed. I wish that you guys were the ones reading it, and I was the one listening, laughing my ass off as you guys suffer. But unfortunately, you guys get the joy of watching me suffer. Well, we are on the fourth fanfic of Belmont 2500's lovely series called The Land Before Time, Journey Across Time, or as the other title is, the Land Before Time Unleashed for the Dark Lord. That's the, the, this fanfic. It's rated T. It's in English. It's adventure. And it has seven reviews. Land Before Time Unleashed for the Dark Lord by Belmont 2508. Note, Ada won't be appearing in the story, but she will be in the Land Before Time Unleashed by... There's going to be another one after this? No. No, 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 no. After I read the origin story, I am not reading the next fanfic if it ever is published. Why? Because I think I've had enough of this series. I'm not going to do any more after the origin story. Next week is going to be the last week involving this author in his stupid fanfics. I'm just making myself clear. And besides, I don't think I really need to read the fifth story at this point to give a well-rounded critique of this series in general. I could probably do a well-rounded critique right now, but no. I said I was going to read all of them and the prequel, and that's what I'm going to do. But when that one comes out, I'm not reading it. Once, ten years ago, a time rift appeared, and a teen was engulfed in that rift. The boy had... Um, why is the rest of that sentence continued in the other paragraph? And also, I thought this was supposed to take place 11 years before 1997, not 10. Or 11 years after 1997. I don't know. I seriously think this author needs to do his math. Because 2009 minus 10 would be 1999. Yet, it's supposed to be in 1997 that the first rift appeared. So, if you add 10 to 1997, it would be 2007. In fact, thinking about it even more, if 1997 is supposed to be 11 years before 2009, that doesn't make any sense. It's actually 12 years before 2009. So this person really needs to figure out how to do his math. Big time. In fact, the character Ethan should be older than 14 in 19 in 2009. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I I, I just want to move forward. You know what? Fuck all this. Let's let's just move forward with the story. Let's read it and get it over with so I can get to the prequel and then finish. Possession of a sword that was said to control time, and it was said the sword was the cause of the rift. Why is there so many commas in that sentence? Many years later, three more rifts of, uh, bleh, followed, and a new team named Ethan Sullivan, Gag, entered them. He saved the Great Valley from Andrew Jones, a devilish boy who wants only vengeance on Ethan. So Andrew Jones is supposed to be a kid as well? They didn't really specify that in the earlier stories. Yes, he had a vendetta with the guy, with this guy ever since he was in diapers, pretty much. With the help of the Great Valley residents, not really, Ethan managed to overcome Andrew and it was then and was then sent back home. But one month later, Ethan returned again and fought a revenge-stricken Andrew and the Harkonnen that battled with him. So pretty much all these stories are just a rehash of the first story except with a different battle and I'm assuming in this story it'll be a different villain, but it's pretty much the same exact thing. Ethan gets sucked into a time rift. He meets up with the Great Valley residents. They have to fight a war against a villain. He gets sucked back home. The end. 
That's a, that's pretty much what happens in every single story, and something tells me the same thing's going to happen in this story. Let's not waste any more time, though, and just continue reading. After that, Andrew was defeated... Well, yeah, Andrew was defeated a second time. Again, exactly one month after those events, Ethan returned a second time, but this time Andrew managed to connect the two worlds, and this time Andrew had an army of his own, but once again Ethan prevailed. It was Destiny, and now two months later the story continues, unfortunately. You ruined my life, said Andrew's father, who evidently had caught Ethan attempting to break into and search Andrew's house. Yes, I always break into the house of my mortal enemy to search for things. No, I never ruined anyone's life. Andrew did. Ethan retorted. My son would never do such a thing, Mr. Jones yelled furiously. Yes, he would. He threatened to kill me and almost succeeded in doing so three times, Ethan replied. Well, if he did, he never told me, Mr. Jones hissed. Well, that's probably the stupidest comeback I've ever heard anyone say. Well, he never told me, so that justifies what he did. So there. <laughs> Can I leave now? said Ethan. Don't you mean asked Ethan, seeing he's asking a question? See the question mark? That means he's asking a question, so it should say asked Ethan, not said Ethan, you idiot! No, you may not, Mr. Jones yelled. That's just too bad, Ethan said. Then he ran out of the dining room and into the living room. Adios, amigo, he yelled as he escaped through the window. I know I'm supposed to like Ethan because he's the protagonist, but I hate him with a passion. He's a fucking douchebag. I hate him. Get back here, Mr. Jones demanded. Ethan was already darting between houses on the street below. It was dark. The moon was a little more than a sliver in the cold night sky. Once safely back at his house, Ethan turned on the TV to the news and watched, memorized as the local reporter continued. This is the fourth time it's happened. We're seeing lightning in what looks like a wormhole, said one of the news reporters. Okay, the missing punctuation marks are really starting to piss me off. I've seen several reviews for this story where, or for the, the series, if I am to restate that, where people talk about the bad grammar and you think this person, if he actually reads these reviews, would make an effort to make sure that he, you know, listens to them and puts punctuation marks, but clearly he hasn't been listening, seeing this is the fourth story in the series. And the rewritten story was bad. It was really bad with the grammar. Yes, indeed. It happened once in 1997, and again three times this year, said another reporter. Ethan knew it was a fourth rift. It was coming. He grabbed his sword and his backpack. He was ready to return for the fourth time. At precisely 9.15 p.m., Ethan stood outside in his front yard, prepared. Okay, Mom, I'm going to another time rift. See you in roughly a month. Okay, Ethan, have fun protecting the Great Valley. Bye! What? What? Whatever. Sure enough, the rift came and took him. As he traveled through the rift, he heard voices, but not all were those of the Land Before Time residents. He heard others. Are you Dante? said a female voice. Cry is coming with us, Sora, said a male voice. I don't know about this lore. Going after the scoring would could be risky, said a male voice. Dr. Jones, said a menacing male voice. Dark times lie ahead for the Great Valley said a voice. Do you remember the way to the Great Valley? said a soft female voice. Ethan awoke to the same clearing. Near him lay an object, what looked like a spray bottle. On the front of it, it read Revival Potion, and on the back it read This is an item you require. You will need it to succeed. You need more allies and someone else. You must use this to revive her. Revive who? Ethan mused, as he left the clearing with the item he obtained wondering who he had to revive. As he approached Littlefoot's home, it became clear. There at Littlefoot's home, he could see her. Ethan now knew who he had to revive now. You do not need now in that sentence twice, you idiot. Littlefoot's mother. He spotted Littlefoot. Ethan, you're back, Littlefoot said. Yes, I know, and I'm going to have to leave, Ethan replied. Why? Well, I received this item called a revival potion that I could re resurrect anyone or anything. I'm going to test it out on your mother. It will bring her back, Ethan said. Really? Littlefoot replied happily. Trust me, it will work out fine, Ethan replied.
So what if he comes back to see her and she's like a skeleton? Would it revive her? Would she just be a walking skeleton? I don't know. Will you go now? Littlefoot asked. No, I'll go tomorrow. I mean, come on, it's almost midnight, Ethan replied. Then he went to sleep. At Dracula's castle... I forgot that in the last story, the new bad guy was introduced to be Dracula, who for some reason is obsessed with the Great Valley and wanting to have it. It's a forest. It's, it's a forest full of dinosaurs. That's what it is. I don't get why all these villains are so interested in the stupid Great Valley. Dracula's castle, the Count sensed that Ethan had returned. I see your back. I can just taste the blood of you and everything living in that valley, Dracula said. Death then came in. My lord, it seems an intruder has entered the castle, a Belmont, Death said. Fine, we'll just send him somewhere else, Dracula said. Then Dracula teleported out of the castle keep and into a hall where Simon Belmont waited. Slaying wave after wave of Dracula's forces, death appeared before him. Oh my god. This is the Castlevania game. You've got to be kidding me. Why is the story... Okay, I know that in the document itself it says that the story is called Land Before Time Unleashed, but the four, first story is called Land Before Time, Journey Across Time, and it's stated that the Rift Sword is used to travel through time. Traveling be through games and movies is not traveling through time, it's traveling through fantasy. Oh my... <sighs> that story makes me want to scream. We need some air in this room. <sighs> Let's continue. Death, Simon yelled. Hello, Belmont. You shall go no further, Death replied. Death's reply should be in a separate line, not in the same line as Simon's line. Is it really that hard to use the fucking Enter Key? Then Simon was sucked into a portal which immediately closed. Gee, I wonder where he's going. Back at the Great Valley, Ethan was preparing to leave the valley on a quest to revive Littlefoot's mother. He waved to the residence as he left. He wandered past the volcanoes in the Long Neck Rock, and on the second day he came to where the great earthquake had split the land. Many deep chasms awaited Ethan. He jumped over a deep crevice and then he saw it. Right in front of Ethan lay the corpse of Littlefoot's mother. Ethan saw the two injuries that Sharptooth had given her that fateful night, as well as, he, as well as others due to scavenging predators. Ethan sprayed some of the revival potion on her corpse just before raptors appeared and attacked Ethan. He pulled out his sword and charged at them, impaling one, he turned and slaughtered about six, then did a horizontal slash at a raptor that ran at him. The rest of the pack ran in fear. Okay, this is so, so, so unrealistic. Ethan's supposed to be, gee, I don't know, 14? So it makes no sense that he would be this powerful against prehistoric dinosaurs. Doesn't matter if he has a sword or not, I still think that he would have a harder time killing them than he has been in these stories. I mean, Belmont writes this guy like he's a freaking superhero. I mean, does the sword have, like, special powers where it makes him powerful? I don't know. It's not really explained. All we know is that the stupid sword is used to travel to other quote-unquote times, although I don't really consider it time. It's more like realities or universes. Ugh. Cowards, Ethan said. One predator circled. Have a period after said, please. One raptor circled back, coming at Ethan. As it attacked one last time, a large tail came out and smacked the raptor to the ground. Ethan turned to see Littlefoot's mother alive and well. Ethan was amazed. The potion, it worked. What happened? Who are you? Littlefoot's mother said. The name's Ethan Sullivan, Ethan replied. Then Littlefoot's mother saw the sword Ethan carried. That sword, Nick, Littlefoot's mother said. 
Oh, this. Nick gave it to me the day he died, Ethan replied. What about Littlefoot? Is he alive? Did he find the Great Valley? Um, okay. First of all, why is the D and did underlined? Second of all, what the heck is with the slash for Great Va- They forgot to hit the shift key when they went to put down the question mark. My dear Belmont, from how you write these stories and how you have credits at the end of them, you act like these stories are the greatest fanfics that ever graced this earth. Well, I have I have news for you. They are not! And grammar mistakes like that prove it! It's not just the grammar people either. It's not just the grammar. And one more thing, I think Littlefoot's mother would know if he made it to the Great Valley, seeing it was her spirit that was guiding him throughout the movie. Littlefoot's mother searched Ethan's eyes questioningly. Yeah, he found the Great Valley and has lived there for a year. A year? A year? Um, when something dies, especially back then in prehistoric times, there's a little thing called decomposing. You see, if I was to randomly die in this room, and if this house was abandoned, and if my body laid here for an entire year, I would be decomposed. I would probably be really rotten looking or a skeleton. I would not be perfectly like this a year later. I would be decomposed. No skin, no hair. The clothes would probably stay, but what you would see is a skeleton staring back at you. So it makes no sense that Littlefoot's mother's body would be in perfect condition when Ethan finds it. He mentions that it has bite marks on it, but that's pretty much it. And if scavengers did go after Littlefoot's mother, there wouldn't be anything left. And the bones would probably be scattered all over the place. Well, maybe not. I mean, she is a long neck, but still. She, there wouldn't be much flesh left. And if it's a year later, she'd probably be, gee, I don't know, a skeleton. Be more realistic. And do your research, you frickin' idiot. That's how long you've been dead, Ethan replied. Can you take me there? Yeah, I'm supposed to go back alive after all, Ethan said. Fuck you, Ethan, I hate you with a passion. Well, we better get going, Littlefoot's mother replied. By the way, can you tell me your true name? Ethan asked. My name is Savannah. Okay, if this author decided to make up a name for Littlefoot's mother, why couldn't he have done the same for Littlefoot's grandparents and the old... Well, the old one's understandable, but Littlefoot's grandparents... I don't know. <sighs> Littlefoot's mother said, so the two left. Ethan led Savannah to the place that she began traveling to. Wrong? To. It's supposed to be T-O, not T-O-O. -O, five years before her death. It took five days for them to return to the valley. Once there, Ethan walked through the canyon pass with Savannah by his side. Well, I gotta tell you, this stuff really works, Ethan said, walking into the great... walking into the valley holding the revival potion in the air. Mother... Littlefoot yelled joyfully. Littlefoot, Savannah said. This had to be the, the best moment ever. Ethan was back, Littlefoot was reunited with his mother, and news had arrived that Bronn was returning to the Great Valley. But although at that moment Ethan couldn't possibly know, danger awaited him and his friends. Littlefoot, his mother, and the rest of the Great Valley residents were all in peril. When night fell, Ethan had trouble staying at Littlefoot's home. Why is the S in staying capitalized? Ethan heard Savannah weeping a little. What's wrong with you? Ethan said calmly. I just wish I'd never met him, Savannah replied. Who? Ethan asked. Why is there a question mark for Ethan asked? There's an understandable reason for their question mark being after the word who, but for Ethan asked, it should be a period, not a question mark. Jeez. Ron, he could be dead, and I let Littlefoot sneak off, Savannah whispered. What? What? 
What? Did, 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 did I miss something? Did I? No, I didn't. So what the fuck is this all about? Is this supposed to be in the past before Savannah died? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I don't care to know. He isn't dead. He came here before. Do you realize that if Littlefoot didn't sneak off, someone would have died anyway? Sarah wouldn't would have snuck off alone, and the Tyrannosaur would have killed her. On that night, you died with honor, Ethan said. Thank you, Savannah said. She nuzzled Ethan, then fell asleep. The next morning, Ethan woke up and walked toward the center of the valley to greet everyone. Once there, he saw only Old One. I see you're up early, Ethan said. So are you, Ethan, Old One replied as she gave a weak smile. Well, I think we should head down to the Thundering Falls. Shall we? Ethan said casually. Yes, Old One replied. Once at the Thundering Falls, Ethan and Old One found something out of the ordinary. They heard what sounded like carnivores. Old One, I'm going to check that out, Ethan said. So are we, a voice announced. Ethan turned to see Littlefoot, Sarah, Ducky, Petrie, and Spike. Frankly, the Land Before Time characters in these stories just seem to be background images. Especially the main crew. Ay ay ay. You might need help, Sarah said. Sure, you guys can tag along, Ethan said. It's dangerous. I'm coming with you as well, said Old One. Okay, but I don't think you can make it alive, Ethan replied. Wow, that was real nice of you, Ethan. Although his words were harsh, he was really just trying to protect Old One from the danger he knew they might find. They headed toward the forest. Once there, they searched. Be cautious, Ethan warned them. Suddenly, a rhythmic thump sounded. Oh no, not again, Ethan said. A T-Rex walked slowly towards them. Ethan pulled out his sword and engaged the monster one-on-one. -on -one. The old one prepared to strike the Tyrannosaurus with the tail whip, but the T-Rex struck Ethan with its tail first, knocking him into the old one's side. Okay, people, I need to do something to let you guys know what how a human would most likely compare to the size of a T-Rex. This is a T-Rex. And this is a human. In reality, the T-Rex would win. But is that going to be the case in this story? Probably not, because Ethan is so powerful and so magical that he can defeat anything. No matter what, he could probably take on the planet Earth and he would win. He would just tap it and go flying into the sun. Because Ethan is so magical and strong. The gang shook with fear as the T-Rex glared at them. Suddenly, Ethan remembered something. Don't move. It can't see us if we don't move, Ethan said. Since when is that the case? They have eyes. It's not like they're bats and they're blind. They have eyes. Everyone was still. The Tyrannosaurus looked at them but did not attack. Then suddenly, Ethan struck the Tyrannosaur in its face with his sword. Um, wouldn't it have made more sense for them to just stand still and wait for it to just leave? No, because that would make sense. From the forest darkness, a second T-Rex appeared. It rammed Ethan on the ground. Suddenly, Ethan got up. He was stunned. His face was smeared with blood. Ethan wiped the blood away with his hand, then walked toward the two beasts. Slowly, his eyes burning with fury, Ethan let... Ethan felt the pain of all those the Rexes had killed. Then Ethan charged. He climbed on top of one and stabbed it. Blood poured from the Tyrannosaurus' head as it fell dead. The other charged. The little foot the gang and the old one watched in horror as Ethan severed the T-Rex's leg again. Human T-Rex. And if I had a toothpick that would... Oh, I know. And this piece of paper right here is his sword. That it, 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 it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. This makes no sense. Then stabbed the Rex's left eye. Plunging his sword deep before finally killing it with a final fatal blow. Exhausted, Ethan passed out. 
Baldwin walked toward Ethan's unconscious body, slid the end of her tail under Ethan, and put his body on her back. Okay, he's alive, so stop saying put his body, because if you keep on saying body, you're implying that they're dead. Come on, we must leave. It looked like Ethan wasn't himself, Old One said. They left. At the valley center, everyone wondered what was going on. Old One and the gang entered. Everyone noticed Ethan's unconscious body on Old One's back. Old One sat Ethan's body on the ground, then she told everyone what had happened in the forest. They all gasped in fear. How could this happen? said Grandma Longneck. I don't know. It's all a blur, Old One replied. She placed Ethan on her back again and walked to where her herd stayed. Once there, Old One sat Ethan down and waited for the moment he would come around. Allie spotted them then. She ran to where Ethan's body lay. Old One, what happened? Allie asked. So Old One told the story again. Night fell. A thousand starts... A thousand starts? Don't you mean a thousand... They mean to say a thousand stars. Lit the black velvet sky. Everyone was asleep. It was then Ethan opened his eyes. No, Ethan yelled, thinking the tyrannosaurs were still there. He looked around and saw he was no longer in the forest. Old woman was lying next to him, and he couldn't help but ask her what had happened in the forest. Old one, Ethan said. Old one woke up. Ethan, you've recovered, she said. What happened in the forest, Ethan said. Don't you mean Ethan asked? After the second sharp tooth attacked you, you got back up and killed them violently. Then you collapsed, Old One replied. No, Ethan said quietly before falling asleep. Okay. Old One comforted him and went to sleep herself. The next morning, after Ethan and Old One awoke, they walked to the Thundering Falls. As they were leaving, Allie decided to go see Littlefoot and then meet up with Ethan in the, at the Thundering Falls. Mother, can I go? Allie asked. Sure, Allie, Allie's mother replied. So all the Great Valley residents went to the Thundering Falls. Ethan was amazed he remembered the last time he had been there. His journey to the falls had been delayed by a Velociraptor attack. Now there was no threat, not now at least, and thinking that there was no way Ethan could feel threatened. And just then someone or something jumped from a cliff above, landing with a thud. Ethan saw it. A vampire, complete with fangs and lightning-fast movements, capable of changing form to both bat and wolf. Um, hold on one second. I think this author is forgetting something. A little interesting fact about vampires. They cannot survive in the sunlight in most universes, unless you're a stupid pixie vampire from Twilight. But other than that, in most universes, they're not strong in the sunlight, and they tend to die in the sunlight. And as far as I know, this is supposed to be in the daytime. So this makes no sense. Do your research! The vampire looked at Ethan and said slowly, Sullivan. Suddenly, I'm sorry, then it attacked. Ethan quickly backflipped out of his, out of its attack range, then cut its leg. But the vampire only became a lot faster. It caught Ethan, grabbing him by the throat, paralyzing him in its powerful grip. Grandma Longneck broke in attempting to fight the vampire, but it was but was struck down with one monstrous blow from the vampire's free arm. Okay, let's do this again. No, no, no. Let's say this is a long neck. And, well, I guess this is a bit too small, but let's say that this is a human. Let's do it that way. Vampire or not, I still think the long neck would win. In the midst of this chaos, a portal opened, and through it, a vampire hunter emerged. How convenient! The hunter had a barbarian-style look and red hair, wielding a black weather a black leather excuse me eight-foot whip. The hunter charged the vampire. He lashed out the whip, striking the beast in its heart and killing it instantly. Everyone looked at the vampire hunter. Thanks, I guess I owe you one, Ethan said. Yes, I'm, but before the vampire hunter could finish his sentence, Ethan spoke. Let me guess, Simon Belmont. Yes, I want to stop Dracula, but, well, it got dirty, Simon replied. So how do you end up here, Ethan asked. Death, one of Dracula's most loyal servants, trapped me in some sort of seal, and I ended up here, Simon said. No pun intended. 
Makes sense, I guess, that Whip is the vampire killer, the weapon of the legendary Belmont clan, Ethan said. Simon nodded in silent agreement. Ethan turned to the residents of the Great Valley. Well, we have a new enemy. He's been slain by countless vampire hunters, including the Belmonts. Okay, if they have a new enemy, and if they just stated that the enemy has been slain by the Belmonts, then they don't have an enemy. Now, judging by the vampire Simon has just slain, he has set his sights on this valley. How could he be supposedly dead unless he got brought back to life? His name is Count Dracula, the lord of all vampires, Ethan explained. In the Land Before Time, characters are probably like, huh? <laughs> Simon turned to Ethan. How did you end up here anyway? Time rifts, Ethan replied. The group began to head home. Simon would have to shelter in a cave. Ethan walked with the residents. I received a note from another ally. Solid snit. I am getting sick and tired of this stupid fanfic! snake. Ethan told the group. Who is this solid snake? Topsy asked. Only the best soldier, soldier you'll ever meet and a master of espionage, Ethan replied. Suddenly, Allie started screaming. My head, oh, it hurts. Abruptly, Allie stopped. It's okay, I'm fine now, she said. Allie, Littlefoot exclaimed. You idiots come and get me, Allie snarled. Ethan and Littlefoot saw a strange figure floating behind Allie. What? They both yelled in unison. Ethan noticed faint ripples in the air. Camouflage. Is that your only trick? Ethan said sarcastically. No need for words, Ethan, the figure said, then appeared. I am Psycho Mantis, Psycho Mantis said. This is getting ridiculous. This is getting ridiculous. This is not a Land Before Time fanfic. This is a mind fuck. That's what it is. It's a mind fuck. It's a stupid mind fuck. Mind fuck. Mind fuck. Mind fuck. Mind fuck. No way. Snake killed you, Ethan said. Well, I survived. No, Ethan, this is no trick. It's true power. Your explanation for him being alive is, I survived. So if he had his head cut off, how would he survive that? Or if he was thrown into an oven like Mrs. Lovett was in Sweeney Todd, how would he survive that? You can't just have the excuse of, I survived, because you have to have a real exclamation. Like maybe he was brought back to life or something. With some mystical spell or something like that. It would make more sense than saying, Oh duh, I survived. <laughs> Psycho Mantis replied, Huh? Ethan said, Now I will read your mind. You are a great warrior, but a reckless boy. Ah, you like video games. You like Konami games, right? You like Castlevania, don't you? Hmm. Did you enjoy playing Silent Hill? And you like Contra, too? Wait, you've played Metal Gear Solid, haven't you? Psycho Mantis said. Darn it! Ethan exclaimed, pointing his sword at Psycho Mantis. I told you it's useless. I can read your every thought. The demonstration is over. Psycho Mantis yelled. Allie leaped at both Ethan and Littlefoot and attempted to tail whip them. What's gone into her, Littlefoot? Puzzled. Littlefoot, she, he's controlling Allie. You can knock her out, but don't hurt her. Um, I'm sorry, but the only real way to knock someone out, you would have to hurt them to knock them out. I mean, hello? Susan hit me with this thing in one of my earlier episodes of Fanfic Critic to knock me out. And trust me, it hurt. Don't believe me? Let's have a reenactment. Hit me with your best shot. Come on. Me. Oh, oh there's going to have to I bet you can't. <laughs> Ow! 
Ouch! Ethan explained. Littlefoot came up behind Psycho Mantis, but Mantis turned and hit Littlefoot with a boulder. It's useless. I can read you like an open book, Mantis explained. Ethan fainted, then attempted to slash Mantis from the left. Mantis knew Ethan's every move. Littlefoot attempted to surprise Psycho Mantis by attacking him from the rear while he fought with Ethan. But it was to no avail. Psycho Mantis knew each opponent's move as they executed them. The battle continued, but each attempt to bring Psycho Mantis down was thwarted. Then the battle took an unexpected turn. From the far side of the meadow, Solid Snake appeared in the battlefield. He pulled out his pistol. How convenient! He shows up right in the nick of time to save their sorry asses! Predictable! No psychic powers for you, Snake said, aiming his pi the pistol at Psycho Mantis. Snake fired. Psycho Mantis was too busy reading Ethan and Littlefoot's minds and countering their attacks to recognize Solid Snake's voice before it was too late. The bullet hit Mantis in the back of the head and exited the front of his gas mask. Psycho Mantis dropped to the ground, the bullet striking a fatal blow. Let's see you survive that, dumbass. Allie lost con- That's not how you spell consciousness! There's no T in there. As Psycho Mantis died, in a moment Allie came to again, wrong to, in control of her faculties once more. So what is she, a bathroom? <laughs> oh God. Well, I guess we're gonna need more than we are not were we are w e apostrophe r e well i guess we're gonna need more than don't you mean then? This to kill that blood-sucking count. I sent messages to everyone I could reach. With what exactly, Ethan? You're in the Great Valley. It's prehistoric times, so you technically should not have any way at all of contacting these people. Meanwhile, in another reality, the time was the 21st century. The night was dark and cold. Streets light lit a city block. Traffic was non-existent. Silence filled the air. Moths flitted around the streetlights, a rare sign of life in the noiseless night. A man traveling on foot pulled his trench coat around himself against the chilled air. Head down, he crossed the street and approached a, dila, or a dilapidated shop. A neon sign hung on the roof above the rust-colored canopy. It read, Devil May Cry! This is getting ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous. Entering the shop, the man was confronted by a young man in his mid-twenties. All in for one so young, he was silver-haired. He was dressed in a red leather double-tailed jacket, black pants and boots sitting on his desk nonchalantly eating pizza. Are you Dante? the man asked. Yes, why, Dante replied. I have something for you, a letter, the man replied. Reaching into his pocket, Dante took the letter and opened it. It said something about killing vampires in a great valley, and it was sent by someone named Ethan Sullivan. I always wanted to kill a vampire. Just slaying demons can be tiring, Dante commented. Across time, far into the future, and in another place, orbiting in space above the planet SR-388, Thirty light years from the planet Zebus, a blonde woman dressed in a blue jump sh jumpsuit sat in the cockpit of her sh cockpit of her ship. She had re she had just received a message. She quickly read the words, and then a power suit appeared, covering her zero suit. Oh God, no! Oh God, no! Please, no! Don't! Please, don't let that be sa same as from Metroid. Oh Jesus Christ! It probably is her, isn't it? Ay ay ay. She abruptly reset her course, adjusting the throttle and pressing an array of lit buttons. 
The dials on her navigation panel spun quickly. The computerized voice of the ship's navigation system announced, Course changed. Destination, Earth. Time, Cretaceous period. Still in another world, mid-20th century, at Destiny Islands, a boy sat on a bent tree overlooking a vast ocean. The incoming waves gently lapped against the shore. His brown hair was spiked. He wore red pants, a white shirt, a multicolored coat, and large oversized yellow boots. Another boy ran up to him. Hey, Sora, you got a note. It's from a guy named Ethan Sullivan, Riku said. Sora read the letter, then a key, then the key blade appeared in his hand. Well, let's go, Sora said. A universe away, late 20th century, the sun cast a brilliant light across the morning. For the briefest moment, everything was new. Inside the brownstone library, a ponytailed woman wearing shorts, a blue leotard, and brown boots sat reading a note. The slightest line of a grin touched upon her face. She rose and left. At a university, a man entered the office of Dr. Henry Jones, Jr., also known as Indiana Jones. No. 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 You're not doing this. You are not ruining Indiana Jones for me, Belmont. No way. You are not doing it. I, I, the review must continue, even if it means the end of my life. Indy received the letter, read it, and left. Back at the Great Valley, Ethan awaited the arrival of those he sent a message to, and everyone prepared for both a fight and an infiltration mission. Well, it's time to put my father to rest once again, said a voice. Ethan turned and saw the son of Dracula, Alucard. Exactly, Alucard, Ethan replied. We're with you too, said another voice. In front of Ethan stood two STARS members, Chris Renfield and Jill Valentine. Resident Evil! You're sucking Resident Evil into this story as well! I was not joking when I said this story is a mind fuck, and this right here is proving my point. Of course, although there there are no zombies, Ethan said. We're okay with that, Jill replied. Ethan saw a bronze apatosaur enter the valley. Bron, and Shorty was with him as well as his herd. Need a couple more, Bron asked. You bet, Ethan replied. You better not forget about us, kid, Doc, said as he ran in with Dara. Don't worry, I won't. You better not die, Ethan replied. Well, I'm sure we've almost got enough, Savannah said. Savannah, is it really you? Bron could hardly breathe. Yes, it's me. But how did you? I thought you died, Ethan replied. I did, but Ethan came back and brought me back, Savannah, uh, Savannah replied. With a spray. Jeez, maybe the next time I commit suicide, I'll leave a note for Susan to tell her to spray me with something and I'll come back to life. Littlefoot and the gang were out playing with Shorty, then Ethan walked up to them. When you're done... Wrong your Jesus fucking Christ! It's Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, not Y-O-U-R. How many times... <sighs> Whatever. When you're done playing games, it's time to get back to business, Ethan said before walking back to the adults. Dante arrived just then. Armed with his rebellion sword and the pistols, ebony and ivory. Okay, how did these people manage to get to the Great Valley? I mean, I can understand some of them, like, you know, the ones who are from the future, but, like, how would Indiana Jones get there? I don't know. It's, it's, it's stupid. Well, when do we start, Dante remarked. As soon as everyone gets here, Ethan replied. A ship called the Gumi ship landed and Sora walked out. So are we prepared? Sora asked. Not yet, Ethan answered. As yet another ship landed in the bounty hunter Samus Aran exited. Oh, God. As we speak, there's a little Nintendo nerd crying right now. She remained silent. A motorbike appeared. Ridden by Laura Croft! Not Laura Croft! Not Laura! Laura! 
Get out of this story! Go away! You don't want to be in this story! Shoo! Shoo! There's much better fanfics out there for you to invade! Go! Don't be in this story! I beg you! Beg you! Don't be in this story! God, God, oh my God, my childhood is getting eaten away as I speak, it's getting eaten away, oh my God, oh God, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, written by Warcrop, the explorer, and as soon after a plane landed carrying Indiana Jones, my childhood is going bye-bye. Ethan s thought he had everyone, but suddenly one more member appeared. Cloud Strife! Tell me why I shouldn't do it. Tell me why. I might as well. I should, because I would rather kill myself than read the rest of this stupid fanfic. Well, the fanfic isn't over, and I told you all I would review all the fanfics, so I have to continue, unfortunately. So this is it, said Cloud. Well, at least I should be thankful that Vincent Valentine isn't in this. My god, my friend Liz would have a heart attack. Yes, but we still have to wait for Grandma Long next to return. Hopefully then we'll be able to locate Dracula's castle. Okay, when did... Oh, whatever. <clears throat> Ethan noted. He walked down to the entrance and saw Grandma Longneck walking in it. Okay, where do we start? Ethan questioned out loud. The castle is about four miles from the valley to the east. Don't worry, we'll survive. Grandma Longneck informed him. We don't need your darn charity, Ethan said. He turned and then began to leave. Okay, what the fuck was that all about? Ethan, Grandma Longneck exclaimed. What? It had nothing to do with that. I was just doing what was necessary, Grandma Longneck explained. Can you see the sunset from the north? Ethan asked. Okay, what the hell was with Ethan there being a jerk to Grandma Longneck? What the heck was that all about? And yet they're still nice to him, and now it's... whatever. Yeah, she assured him. Can you see it from the south? Ethan continued. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Grandma Longneck replied. I didn't mean what I said. Ethan spoke with only a hint of, rem hint of remorse in his voice. I don't get why he was being a jerk to begin with. With that, Ethan left, looking quite worried. If any come to the valley, hold them off, Ethan said. We will, Grandma Lo Grandpa Longneck replied. Ethan, tee he get It's the, not tee he they put a space between the T and the H in the word thus, so it just says T-He. And the newly arrived others left for Dracula's castle. Once they, once there, they stood at the entrance. So is Dracula's castle supposed to be in the Great Valley? <sighs> Dracula, we're coming for you. We're coming for you. Ethan announced as they entered immediately. Simon killed a zombie, then felled another two. As they entered the darkened hall, two bats emerged menacingly from the shadows. Laura immediately shot them down with her dual pistols. Indiana Jones fought alongside Simon, whipping zombies and bats. Come on, Ethan said. From the door ahead, skeletons rushed out, throwing bones at the group surged forward. As the group surged forward. Littlefoot dodged the bones and boomerangs and the boomerangs the skeletons threw, turned and tail whipped them. They moved to they moved forward and entered the next room, heading down the stairs within. Ethan and the others advanced slowly. Suddenly a merman jumped up. Many more followed it, but they were no match for Ethan's sword. The group moved into another hall and immediately encountered more zombies. Chris and Jill dispatched Dispatch them with ease, because Chris and Jill are both from Resident Evil. No shit! The air filled with the sounds of wings. A giant vampire bat appeared. I take care of him. Don't you mean I'll take care of him? Simon said. No pun intended. 
Executing a combination of whip strikes, the knife thrusts Simon dispatch the hideous beasts. After I'm um, wait, what? Another or another? Don't you mean another? They they are missing the O in another. Another flight of stairs led them down to the dungeon. Axe armors immediately attacked the group. So Ethan and Simon engaged them and defeated them, only to be confronted by Medusa heads. Darn, I hate Medusa heads. Stop saying darn and say damn! You have no problem writing violent stuff in your stories, and yet... It, it, oh my god, I, I like, can't write a swear because it's a naughty word. Well, grow up and put down swears because if you have them replaced with the words darn, or darn, I can't even speak darn, it sounds childish and stupid. So let's say, well, let's rephrase that sentence with the word that belongs there. Damn, I hate Medusa heads, Ethan said. Then Sora killed all of them. Why? They're not that bad, Sora remarked. They are when you don't have the keyblade, Ethan said. Suddenly a golem appeared. Me not made to lose, it said. Me will make you lose, Petrie said and flew at him. But the golem hit Petrie. Well, at least that was more realistic than how Ethan has been when he deals with T-Rexes. Simon stepped forward and hit the golem, killing it. Medusa appeared. I knew I would find you here, Medusa snarled. After going through another four more halls within the dungeon, death appeared before them. Um, okay, what exactly happened with them and Medusa? Did they defeat her or did they just walk around her? I mean, seriously! What the fuck? Death appeared before them. You shall go no further, Death commanded. Alucard struck out at him. You know, I'm going to close the door again. I think I've had enough air come into this room where I cool off a little bit. So where was I? Ah, yes. Ah, Alucard, what is your business with these foolish creatures, Death said. I've come to end this. Step aside, old man. Alucard said, Ah, insolent boy, I will teach you a lesson, Death roared, throwing his scythe at Ethan and Alucard. They both dodged it. Ethan hit Death and Alucard and the rest followed suit. Followed suit? Hitting Death so many times he had to reveal his true form. He jumped and attacked with his scythe, but he was felled by Ethan and Simon. Of course! Simon's so great. No, no, Ethan's so great that he can even defeat Death. No, how could this be? Ah, Death screamed as he died. Ethan and the others turned and walked back up the stairs to the castle keep. They walked in and found Dracula sitting on his throne. Dracula died. You don't belong in this world, Ethan snarled. So I guess this is still supposed to be the Great Valley, which doesn't make any sense. It isn't by my hand that the humans kept paying tribute. Dracula replied, Tribute? You're a thief. You steal men's souls. Their freedom, Simon yelled. Freedom is always sacrificed to faith, good hunter. Or are you truly here by choice? Dracula replied. All we're here for is you. You're nothing but a blight on mankind, Ethan said. Mankind, a cesspit of hatred and lies. Fight for them, then, and die for their sins. Dracula hissed, teleporting off his throne and appearing in front of the group to unleash fireballs from beneath his cape. Ethan dodged them and did an, o and did an overhead swing, hitting Dracula in the face. Then Alucard ran up with his sword, but Dracula pulled out his own. Return to me, my son, Dracula said. Father, don't make me do this, Alucard pleaded. From the side, Littlefoot headbutted, then tail whipped Dracula, and Sarah rammed him. Well, at least they're kind of doing something in this story, at least. They were thrown back by Dracula's power. I am darkness, and darkness is eternal. On this night, you, your world will end, Dracula said. I don't think so, Ethan replied before, jumping up and hitting Dracula in the shoulder. Dracula transformed. Behold my true form, Dracula said, releasing another round of fire whipped him in the heart, and Laura shot him in the head, and everyone quickly attacked Laura. Ethan moved forward, de moved forward, decapitated Dracula with one mighty blow of his sword. Okay, that was lame. The battle was over. Ethan and the others ran out of the castle and saw it go down. They returned to the Great Valley. The residents were amazed. They all returned. Well, Dracula's dead, Ethan said. 
Cheers erupted and Ethan knew that one day he would have to come back, but then a rift came. This time the rift didn't take Ethan, it took everyone. Ethan and the Great Valley residents suddenly found themselves in a dark place. They heard rain. Ethan took and ignited a torch. Suddenly a Tyrannosaurus Rex roared in his face. Just behind it was a sign that read Jurassic Park. Ethan looked at it. Oh no, he grumbled. The end. Thank you for reading. To be continued in The Land Before Time Unleashed 5, Survival. Credits. Once again. Belmont 2500 presents Land Before Time Unleashed 4, The Dark Lord. I'm not going to read the credits. I am not going to read the credits. I... I... Ooh. Just to let you guys know, the fifth story hasn't been published yet. Thank God. And hopefully, if this person gets enough bad reviews, it won't be. But this isn't the end yet. Next week, I'm going to be taking a look at the prequel to this monstrosity of a series. And let me tell you this. You're probably going to see one of the biggest rants ever that I have ever done. It's not going to be pretty. I would do it right now, but I still have to save it up for the prequel. But I don't think I've ever read a series of fanfics this bad that have... Well, like I said before, we'll save it for next week. Until then, I'm the fanfic critic. I read it, you listen, and I need to regain some of my precious childhood memories.